Peter, um, welcome ladies and gentlemen to our transportation foreman. Um, the theme of this year's conference, as we are all very familiar, is the energy, tra energy transition. And we've had speaker after speaker say that this will come faster than many expect. I mean, for the oil industry, this will be most sharply felt in transport, where hydrocarbons have been largely unchallenged for a century. And perhaps uncomfortably, the oil industry is not the leading agent of change here, with automakers, for instance, turning increasingly towards battery and other advanced technologies. I mean, change is happening faster in some markets too, and in some segments with passenger vehicles um, initially being electrified, but also possibly heavier sectors looking, too, looking vulnerable too, as battery technology improves and hydrogen fuel cells are advanced. I mean, how companies adapt to this transition will be crucial, and how they integrate new fuel offerings alongside, alongside traditional fuels. To help get to the bottom of some of these questions, we have a diverse panel here, drawing on expertise from the automobile, battery, and oil industries. So if you'd let me please introduce, we have on my left here, Stefan Herbst, who is Technical Gen General Manager with Toyota Motor Europe, and responsible for R&D in hydrogen and sustainable mob mobility. And we have Anil Shrivastava, who is Chief Executive Officer of Le Clanche, a Swiss battery maker and energy storage specialist, which has been doing some very interesting work with electric ferries, which I hope Anil will talk to us about. And finally, Jaime Martin Juez, who is Corporate Director and Technology New Ventures at Repsol, in charge of research and development portfolio and the corporate venture capital investments. So to start with um, Stefan, um, as an automaker, can you tell me what's your perspective on, the, on, the, on this challenge and this change ahead of us? Actually, what we are facing at the moment is a one-in-a-lifetime challenge and opportunity. We know we need to transform uh, the transport sector, and this is supported by many different technologies that develop at the same time. We talk about connected mobility, automated, shared, and electrified, and that's uh, the topic of, of today. But the point is that most of these technologies and development is not market-driven, and that is a, a key challenge going forward. It is driven by achieving higher societal goals. We have committed to meet Paris Agreement. We, um, cities are facing air quality issues. Um, we are talking about safety. So we want to achieve these higher societal goals. This is why we develop and that's why we are here. We discuss all these different kind of technology. So the revolution is, is not the technology in itself. It is that we need to find new business models and a new cooperative approach to work among different sectors and also a new way to work between industry and policymakers. Because if just one car OEM or one industry goes forward without the other, without policy support, we risk to fail as society. Therefore, for me, the actual revolution is uh, to find this new way of working together in achieving these wider societal goals. Thank you very much. And Anil, I mean, we saw yesterday that lithium-ion batteries won the Nobel Prize for chemistry <laughs> for their contribution to, to humanity's um, progress. I mean, can you tell us from your perspective, I mean, how you see this technology moving forward? First of all, it's a good time to speak when lithium our battery inventors have got Nobel Prize. There's a lot in the announcement of the Nobel Prize Committee if you see what lithium technology was and what it is today. But if I have to put it into perspective, building upon what Stefan said, lithium ion technology has moved from being something as a backup power system, rechargeable, to today is part of the infrastructure. It's part of the infrastructure in renewable energy integration, more renewable, better integration of renewable energy, and it is at the heart of electric vehicles of all kinds. And how's that happening? It, there's been two dimensions, two themes in the industry. One is continue to increase the energy density, therefore reduce the cost. And second theme has been do so with safety. You can always create a 500 watt hours battery if you like. Is it safe to operate when you are operating in an electric vehicle? So the industry has been focused on these dual challenges, and I believe we have managed it pretty well. I'll just leave one number for you. When these inventors invented lithium batteries, their energy density was about 65 watt hours per kilo, 25 years back. 
Today, we are at 230 watt hours per kilo. So it gives you a little bit of perspective. The roadmap takes us to 300 watt hours per kilo very, very shortly. So industry has moved, and the batteries have inherently become safer. And Jaime, finally, I mean, you're um, at Repsol, as fuel supplier, I mean, you're on the ground here at the sharp end. I wonder if you could talk to us about when you're approaching kind of EV charging, kind of what your expectations are in, 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 in this sector as, I mean, it's fast moving and fast changing. Okay, uh, thank you, Ronan, by the, by the question. Well, I would, I would like to highlight, okay, we could say that we are doing our homework and I would give you a pair of examples. Uh, this Monday, we inaugurate in the north of Spain the biggest and fastest uh, recharge point uh, in Europe, okay? It's the second one. I, I, um, I, in May, we, we inaugurate the other one. But it's not only this. I mean, we have been working on this in, in building up uh, uh, electricity and power uh, infrastructure uh, in Spain during the last five years. I mean, now we have 70 hundred points in different uh, localizations. Uh, so we are convinced that we have to do something on this. We are part of the solution, but it's not only this. Uh, why I say this? Because we have to lean this regarding what we want and how we envision our company in the future. Three weeks ago, Goldman Sachs uh, highlighted the issue that Repsol was the company who was investing uh, most uh, heavily in the renewables uh, regarding its size. We are convinced that we have to do that. Uh, the Transparency Initiative, uh, I highlight two weeks ago, that Repsol was one of the only two companies in the oil and gas sector that were really committed to the Paris Accords uh, goals. So if you don't do only this kind of homework, embed it in a really uh, big uh, framework about your strategy, it's not enough. So I think that we are doing our work on that. Yeah. And I mean, as you're looking to develop your EV strategy, how do you fit it in with your kind of wider operations and with the wider energy transition strategy? I mean, are you looking to kind of bring them together? Yeah, well, it's not an easy, uh, an easy task, but I would, I would like to say that is, I'm sorry for breaking the, the, the point here, but it's not only about electricity. What we would like to work on the scope three, I mean, the emissions that we produce by the use of our uh, products, is to provide a, a broader range of different products. I mean, it's not only electricity there. We have, for sure, for sure to work on that. But we have to provide hydrogen. We have to provide uh, 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 biomass, uh, biofuels, and so on. So it's how we work on that, trying to wire up the, the, the broad of different options that we provide to our customers. Mm -hmm. And Stefan, um, Jaime mentioned hydrogen there, which is something Toyota is I mean, well known. You, you, you introduced the Mirai, the first commercial um, fuel cell car. I mean, how do you see hydrogen fitting into this, into this transition? Yeah, thank you very much. In the first part of my answer, I was more referring to the societal goals and the challenges. Now let me touch on our core strategy. First on, on electrification, so more than 20 years ago with the introduction of uh, Prius, actually we started to already embark on an electrification strategy. So by today we sold more than 14 million hybrids. That means uh, as Toyota we have produced more than 14 million batteries and we have produced more than four, a 28 million electric motors. Um, looking forward, uh, we have set ourselves a challenge by 2050 to reduce the emissions of our car park by 90%. So that means we have even stronger focus on hybrids, plug-in hybrids, battery electric vehicles, and also, as you mentioned, fuel cell vehicles. Having said that, we believe that electricity, because of energy efficiency reasons, should be used directly as much as possible. That is the most efficient way. However, there are certain applications where it simply doesn't make sense today to deploy batteries. So I talk about trucks, I talk about long distance buses, um, long distance um, passenger vehicles, or all vehicles that have additional power requirement, like cooling units. Mm -hmm. Because of the higher energy density of hydrogen at 350 or 700 bar, it makes more sense to utilize hydrogen. In that sense, um, hydrogen is complementary to battery electric vehicles. It is not either or. We need both to uh, move ahead. And what is 
crucial, but for both technologies, but specifically also for hydrogen, is to get down the cost of the value chain, but also of each um, of the components of, of the car. And therefore, we follow a, a, three, a threefold um, strategy towards the future. First is we reduce the cost of the system itself. When we had the, the first cars in, in 2008, um, we reduced the cost actually by 90% when we introduced Mirai in, in 2015. Mm -hmm. So next year, or actually now, at Tokyo Motor Show, you can see already the next generation of uh, Mirai. So to reduce the cost of the system is one essential part. The second part is we scale up. Today we have a production capacity of 3,000 Mirai per year. As of next year, we ramp this up to 30,000 stack production per year. The third element is to have wider, more applications of uh, fuel cell stacks. That is why you see in Japan um, hydrogen vans that we are testing with 7-Eleven. Uh, we will bring uh, hydrogen buses. So for the Tokyo Olympic next year, you will see in Japan and Tokyo a fleet of 100 hydrogen buses. Next week, we will launch in Brussels at Busworld with, together with Caetano, a hydrogen bus for Europe to be um, on sales as of next year. And in the United States, we have a project um, to, to produce and develop hydrogen trucks. So that all shows you that we want to diversify. And we want to diversify also to increase the take up of hydrogen. Because at the moment, we are in a, if you like, a valley of, of this economically. For infrastructure provider, there is no profit at, at this moment because of the low number of cars. And also for us, it's also not profit yet. We have developed techn technology and it takes some years to get back this revenue. But to shorten this uh, valley of deaths, we believe we need to widen the offer. So you need about 40 Mirai, 40 vehicles to make a business case for a hydrogen station. While if you have a bus, 10 is enough. So by diversifying into fleets, in, into trucks, into buses, we help actually the supply side to make a business case much faster to set up the infrastructure, which then in turn will stimulate more demand, and then that is good for us, so we can increase the sales. By this mechanism, we can accelerate towards moving towards a hydrogen economy. You mentioned fleets there. I mean, and it seems. I mean, how important is is, is that fleet component, um, Anil? I mean, you've done work on, on this, in terms of kind of establishing the market, as, as Stefan was talking about. Sure. Let me build upon what uh, Stefan said. Uh, too much focus has been on cars, cars only. As I think it's important to keep focus on cars. But let me put the society goal and then the economics of it. The society goal is the following. In EU, in European Union, 13% of CO2 per emission is from cars. Do you realize how much it is from marine vessels? It's the same number. Worldwide, marine is very small, 2.5%, 3%. But in Europe, it's 13%. And can you think about how much focus that sector has received? Okay, now if I add to it commercial vans, white vans, buses, trains, trucks. Train is another one we can talk about it. Put that together, they pollute more than the cars. So I think there is a good reason for us as a society to focus on electrification of fleet. The second part on economics, these are fleet operations. It's very, very clear business case. You can make a commercial business case, investment, return on investment, and see whether it makes sense or not. How do we do that? In the fleet, you have the chance to design the battery on board or fuel cell on board or a combination of the two with the charging infrastructure. Because fleets, you know, it goes from point A, B, C, Z. You can plan the charging strategy and then decide what sort of battery technology fuel cell you need on board the vehicle and what's the capacity of that. Third reason, more technical, those of you who are engineer like me, just the efficiency of electric vehicles with the drivetrain. Uh, you mentioned about e-ferry. We inaugurated two weeks back the largest electric ferry in the world in Denmark using 4.2 megawatt hours of Lacroix batteries. Important point, what that 
ferry service does today with 800 kilowatt of engine. Okay, the classical ICE, which is replacing, required 2,000 kilowatt. Same nautical miles, same payload. Okay, what's the gain in efficiency? Almost a factor of 2.2, 2.5. So we will use less energy overall, it's more efficient. And you have got more room to load passengers and cars and trucks rather than more engines. Okay, so the fleet is really important for two reasons again. A, it is a good thing to do for society. B, there's a clear business case. Does that make sense? <laughs> And I mean, I mean how, how do you, you view this? I mean, you're expanding in EVs. Do you see potential in hydrogen? And how well aligned is that to your kind of core businesses as well? I fully agree with the, the approach uh, expressed by Stefan and Neil. And I would say that the hydrogen triangle is quite similar to the power triangle. And you have, with, when we are talking about batteries, and you have in one of the uh, points of the, this triangle, renewables, uh, vehicles and the other one is the stationary in our homes, you see that all the R&D budget during the last 10 years has been expended in the vehicles. But at the end of the day, it's going to be some kind of dynamics as well in stationary uh, batteries in our homes. And it's going to be more common to have in our homes, in our neighborhoods and so on, big batteries or second life batteries from the cars using in our uh, house or in, a, in, in our hospitals and so on. And they are going to play for sure they role in renewables and storage just for peak moments and so on. So we have to work on that triangle and how there are the di different dynamics on that. But if you go to the hydrogen and you think about the hydrogen, how is working that, it's something quite similar. I mean, in this case, it's not the ve vehicles who are pushing this, is more from the facilities and industry and so on, the research on that. But at the end of the day, the hydrogen will be used at some moment to store its energy from renewables. And maybe we will take that uh, not from hydrogen and so on, we will take for uh, hydrogen. And at the same time, we will work in the development of the vehicles. So what is there? There is a new dimensions, new businesses, and we have to be comfortable, like oil and gas, as different companies, power sector, utilities, and so on, getting into these new dynamics and these triangles. Because sometimes they are not quite clear, but for sure, they are working together in these different points. If, if I may just uh, give the practical examples of hydrogen battery, different technologies, in both spheres, electricity as well as in transport. So first, let's talk transport quickly, because my colleague is sitting here. Uh, <laughs> With Toyota North America, we are working for a fleet of heavy transportation. I'm allowed to say only that much as a listed company. We'll leave it at that, okay? With Toyota, which is essentially taking the fuel cell from Toyota, marrying it to a high-power lithium titanate oxide battery. Battery does the job of driving, start, stop, surge, more power, and you put fuel cell in its most comfort zone. Okay, as if you like the word charger on board. Okay, so all of a sudden, this holy grail, every conference you hear, range is a problem, range is a problem. Could you move from Poland to UK? Okay, can you drive long distance trucks? You, you marry that with hydrogen engine or a fuel cell on board with a battery, you have it. Other point which uh, my favorite, uh, much as people like hybrid, I don't like the word hybrid. I think the right term is dual mode. This electric vehicle, electric truck, for example, coming from wherever into the city of London, it can switch completely to electric mode while it's in the city and switches back into fuel cell with batteries when it's on the highway. I call this dual mode rather than a hybrid part of it because both can work independently or together. Okay, so there is a tremendous opportunity to stop this debate about range extension, ranges and anxiety. You put hydrogen engines in a marine vessel, go from Europe to China. There are issues, I'm not saying we need to safely store it. There are issues, it's lighter than fuels uh, these vessels carry by a long mile, even if you take the storage cost into account. So those technologies are here. We are working with Toyota in North America. We are working when an EU project is public, high seas. 
in high seas, we are working for oil and gas industry. We are doing something for oil and gas, guys, okay? Here, in your rig, in your rig, basically, we'll put the battery, cut down the fuel by 25, 30%. We'll take care of all the peaks. Just the peak. Okay, battery is doing only the peak work. And you reduce 25, 30%. Miles away in the sea, if you can save 25, 30% of fuel, I think it's valuable to you, isn't it? I mean, this is happening now. I mean, we're looking, we're, lo we're looking at kind of a, a, a brave new world for, for, for transport and a different world for, for, for oil. I mean, with demand perhaps kind of in question in perhaps personal vehicles first, then heavier transport. But I'm wondering, Stefan, if you can give me an idea, I mean, how revolutionary a change are we looking at? And, and is it going to be abrupt or are we going to see a long tail for, for oil demand into the decades ahead? I think we still will see oil for quite a while. So these are, we talk about a system change, and this will not happen from today to tomorrow. So we need to have infrastructure investments. As I mentioned before, policymakers need, need to buy in. Um, we need to have the technology. So this will take time. But the point is, we don't have so much time to lose. If we want to achieve uh, Paris, the goals of Paris Agreement, we need to act, and we need to act swiftly and jointly with, among different industries and with policymakers. Then we are able to make a revolution. And actually, I mentioned before, cost is, is essential. So at the moment, we work in the Hydrogen Council on a, on a cost roadmap um, for hydrogen along the whole supply chain. This will be published in, in January next year. And there you will see that very quickly, we will move with hydrogen to competitive solution. And as soon as you have reached this point, this is the tipping point to become a revolutionary approach. So TCO will fall, and as soon as this becomes attractive for customers, the market will move fast. So as industry, we need to prepare for this moment because we need time for infrastructure to develop technology. We cannot do, as I mentioned, from today to tomorrow, but we need to anticipate this and we need to prepare. That is um, quite important, and that's what we are doing as a, as a company. Thank you. And Jaime, I mean, I, you, this is something that you're going to have to prepare for. I mean, do you see a danger of, of, of a faster transition happening? Uh, well, for sure. What, one of our obsessions is that we have to provide energy in a sustainable way, but as well in an affordable way. Mm. Uh, and for that, I think that the Stefan uh, make a really good point about cost. And we have to be really, really efficient uh, to try to abate the cost of these new technologies that they are not new, but mm -hmm. in order, but when we take into account everything, I mean, the infrastructure that is needed, uh, the, 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 te the, 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 the technical is itself, and so on. I mean, we need to provide as many f uh, different sources of energy for the people in order to, to do that in an affordable way, mm -hmm. quite quick. So we are trying to do our homework on that, for sure, and the oil and gas sector is doing. And I think that we are uh, able to do that because we have uh, so in the past that we are really, really good doing very big uh, projects and so on. So I am not very, I am exciting, I mean, the future. I mean, mm -hmm. no one's care about that, okay? I suppose one factor of this transition is that it's happening at different paces in different countries. And it's easy here in, in, in London to focus on the developed world and the pressures of protesters, but is this the same story in, in, in other countries? Are we going to see the same pressures? Same. And also countries like China, I mean, they have setting a, a, their sights on a leading in this technology, and, and could this be a game changer? S Stefan? China, for sure, is a very important uh, market, and therefore whatever China does is important and will shape uh, the direction. And we saw China, has embarked on electrification and now recently also on hydrogen. This for sure will accelerate and will change the world of electrification and, and hydrogen. But China is not alone. Also, we see a big movement in Japan. Now, in Japan, we discuss actually how we can stimulate um, to hydrogen economy by producing um, hydrogen in Australia, Shipping, so Kawasaki is currently building um, ships to transport liquid hydrogen to Japan, the harbor of Kobe. And then we discuss there how, where's the demand side, how to utilize this hydrogen for steel industry, for chemical industry, for, for the transport sector. And that is crucial because trans hydrogen has 
the potential to be transported and has to be stored. And this is a fundamental economical function that hydrogen can play in future. When we manage that hydrogen becomes a commodity, then it can be produced, and, um, and we saw in the, in the recent study from uh, the International Energy Agency, for example, in, in Saudi Arabia, where electricity is very cheap, so if we produce electricity, um, hydrogen, in, uh, in Saudi Arabia, and we ship this to Europe, then this becomes a very competitive hydrogen. And um, in Japan, we talk about uh, the target is to have $3 per kilogram hydrogen in the coming years at the harbor in, uh, in Japan. So that means probably at the pump, uh, we can realize a price of, of $5, 5 to $6 per kilogram. And this is a break even, what I mentioned before, for TCO calculation for fleets. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, it strikes me that um, this model of, of producing hydrogen, trans, compressing it, transporting it, this is very close to, to, to what's happening in the oil and gas industry with LNG. I mean, do you think there is a, a, a logical step for the industry in kind of looking to kind of bulk hydrogen? Well, uh, let me jump from the only hydrogen issue to, to more. What I would say is that what we are going to face in the near future is that uh, we don't have a silver bullet for everything. I mean, we are quite uh, familiar with this diesel and gasoline for everything. And in the future, it will be depends on what is the best option for that kind of purpose. I mean, um, the hydrogen will be really good for some issues. And Stefan mentioned some of them. It's, it's going to work quite well for trucks, uh, long journeys, uh, buses, and so on. But maybe for the cars that we are going to use in the cities, well, this is not so, a so good solution. Or maybe for the storage in, uh, of energy in our homes, that will be better if we use a battery or something like that. So what we are going to face in the future regarding, uh, from the technological point of view is that we, we need to know uh, uh, more about different technologies and how we can push off all of them. And Anil, I mean, do you see hydrogen as, 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 as something that's competing with, with, with battery technology or complementary to it? I think I would agree with Stefan. It is complementary. Yeah. Both have a space. Okay, if you broadly look at it without boring into technology, energy storage needs to be understood in three dimensions, in very simple words. One is basically how fast you can respond. Second is how much can you store competitively. Third is how long can you do that charge, discharge, so-called cycles. Hydrogen beautifully fits where today and in next two years I see where lithium stops. Today lithium batteries can go typically for three to four hours of storage, okay, competitively. And if you need it more than that, you can put lithium batteries, it's not competitive. I'm talking about stationary yep. storage here, okay. But you can easily put a gas engine call it hydrogen engine. If you have spare power uh, capacity coming from a wind power plant, what do you do with that? Run to the ground, call curtailment, or do you just take a conversion, do power to gas, produce hydrogen and store? You can use it for storage, from hydrogen back into battery, back to the grid, or you can take that into engine, transport it for mobility. I see the universe where these two technologies a few more, would come and complement each other and find their sweet spot. Yep. I'm not trying to be diplomatic because I can be very critical if I don't like a technology, <laughs> but this one I love it. Okay, so I do believe there is a, if you like, a complementary nature on there, just the physics of the two. Mm. You can look at physics, chemistry, and the cost, it fits in, both the science and economics, if you will. So one can help the other in Indeed, indeed. That's the high seas project for oil and gas industry in marine sector with Toyota for a heavy transportation fleet in North America. Our examples of that, we're already doing it. It's not something, it's a theoretical thought. We are in projects with, uh, with Toyota, we are in projects with high seas with an with a integrator called Kongsberg, Kongsberg Maritime in Norway. So we, we are sure that this combination is going to solve a number of issues, uh, range being the first one. People have been talking range forever and extending that debate beyond a point it should have been. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very important. So the technology is there. Yeah. We are not waiting for a technology breakthrough. So we can start to implement quite fast. 
But therefore, again, I come back, we need uh, political support, we need to scale up. And just to give you some example from, from hydrogen, when we talk about standardization and, and harmonization. So in the United States, today we have in certain cities where you're not allowed to cross a bridge or go under a tunnel with a hydrogen car. In Europe or Japan, is no, no problem. In, in China, we cannot use uh, hydrogen tanks type four. Again, in Europe, in US, Japan, is no problem. In, in Japan, in order to fuel a hydrogen car, you need to have a trained person. So a customer is not allowed to fuel by itself. It needs to be a trained person. So that leads to a situation if the station is closing at 5 o'clock or it's not opening at the weekend, it's very inconvenient, as you can imagine, for customers. While in, in Europe, we have self-serving stations. So again, there is a lot to be done in regulatory and standard and to standardize this in order to be able to, to scale up and harmonize it globally. I fully agree with that. I mean, we are working on that, for example. In, in our refinery, one of the main um, uh, demand uh, processes that we have is the, uh, from hydrogen is the steam reforming, and they produce a lot of CO2. We can produce that from electrolysis, and it's, it's really there. I mean, mm. it's only a question of cost. Mm. Uh, and we can do that for renewables. The renewables, there are many hours during the day that they are producing by zero, for zero. Uh, so the idea is what I have to do with these renewables. I store it in a, in a battery, I store it in a, in a hydrogen, and this hydrogen I can uh, inject directly in natural gas until a 20%, and you, cannot, you don't have to change any infrastructure to do that. So it will demand from our side a new, a, a new kind of trader. Because we are going to mm. be hedging mm. constantly, saying, OK, what I do with this uh, producing renewable? I will uh, store it in hydrogen or whatever. Or I produce this hydrogen, I will dispatch in service station. Or, because, but the technology is there. The, the only problem is how we scale up, scale up this, this technology. Ron, in my view is that, uh, just complementing what a colleague said here, my view is that. Uh, Technology is here. Not everything is competitive. Lithium has gone through a journey, as I mentioned, in energy density is increasing by 3x. So the cost has come down. Hydrogen fuel cells need to get there. They're just at the starting point. The bigger bit is missing. We seem to mix things, this is my perspective, between stationary storage, cars, and rest. Mm. I think if we focus on fleet operations as a separate subject within transport, cars by themselves, stationary storage by themselves, we'll be able to focus properly. When it cars, it's about your gas stations, could I safely put three, four nozzles, to use your word, of EV charging stations? Yep. Okay, can the grid take it? If it can't, put a small storage at the back room. You are done, you can buffer the grid. Yep. Okay, that's car discussion. When it comes to fleet operations, is power, is range, both. Not just the range. And now you're talking about combination of technologies such as batteries and hydrogen fuel cell. When it comes to stationary storage, it's all of the above. It's all of the above, as you were saying. I mean, I, I'm sure I probably use these statistics in this conference or somewhere. Do you know what percentage of electricity generated from renewables in China is curtailed? My favorite line, curtail means polite word to say, you produce and run it to the ground. So turbine is running. You have the cost of running the turbine. Doesn't matter. If grid doesn't need, what do you do? You put it in the ground. Yep. Small fuel cell can produce enough hydrogen to take care of it, either to grid back or to take it into mobility. We waste that energy. The total curt curtailment in northern China is equal to the consumption in the United Kingdom every day. So what the United Kingdom consumes, China runs to the ground every single day of renewable power. Of course, China is scale, so it's an extreme example. Okay, China is scale, but that means, to a lesser extent, same thing happens in Germany. But certainly for, yes. for thought. Um, I'm very conscious that we have, we have only a few minutes left, and I wanted to open it up to questions from the audience. Um, the lady here in the front row. Thank you. Thank you. 
Uh, I'm Fan from Columbia University, learning energy and environment, also from China. So uh, currently, we know China controls the batteries market, really dominant. And it's because the manufacturing costs are really low, like, like countries like the US cannot compare. So if it's, do you foresee any manufacturing innovation on batteries? Like if it's China will control, the, will battery become a new commodity, like control the markets? Uh, another quick question is about EV charging, how to really bring down the cost because the high demand of EV countries like in Southeast Asia and like China, they are living in apartments, people. So it's really hard to install those um, equipment. So that's a good thing to how to offset the capex on. So really how to uh, bring down the EV charging. I don't know if, it, if I make it clear. Well, I'll repeat what I understood from your question. You're saying if China will control the lit lithium battery production, is it a good thing for the world or bad thing? Is that what your question is? Let's ask the question straight, right? <laughs> okay. first, first of all, a big thank you to China for leading the way, investing risk capital when we in Europe, I'm European, okay, have been sleeping. Yeah. At the most, we were talking in conferences like this. Okay. China stimulated the market by mandating a stick and carrot policy for electric buses then progressively into cars. They built a domestic market. At the back of that, they built a large domestic industry. They deserved it. They deserve it. Okay. I say that in EU meetings, that some people don't like it. We are meeting the European Battery Alliance Airbus of the ne next world, but we are too slow. China took the lead, so big thank you for the European policies which have come now, the smart policies. We have learned from China. So China didn't do everything right, that's true, but it invested the capital which was needed to stimulate and scale the industry. Okay, so I think they have done the good part of it, but the second part I will say is, I don't see that as a threat. Your own market is so big. If you exclude your noise part of the battery manufacturers, with all due respect, you got about five, six leading manufacturers, the big ones, CATLs of the world. Okay, then you add to that two, three people from Korea. The, there are very few people in Europe today. Le Cronche, with a gigawatt factory, is the largest in production today in Germany. My production is in Germany. It's minuscule compared to China. But I don't see that China can dominate that. The people who will dominate will be people who will innovate. The batteries you need for different parts of transport is not the same as what you would make 18650 cells for consumer markets. So I don't think China can dominate unless it innovates, with all due respect, now the not so negative, positive part. I would, I'm looking for China to innovate. Do we have been have innovating. Stefan? Excuse me. We have been innovating, somebody has been using. Time has come to get a little bit on the other side. Mm -hmm. And I would add to this, the demand for batteries will be so big that we need multiple sources. Simply the, the capacity today already is not sufficient. I'll just add one number for oil and gas industry, then I'll stop. China is my favorite subject. Okay. A battery cell, even if you say battery pack, is going to cost about $90 to $120. You know the weight of it, right? 3 to $4 will get added in transportation. Okay. In a margin business, which is 10 12% margin business, if you lose one third only in transportation, it's not going to work. So I don't think they can just dominate by the sheer size in China. We'll have to do what is good for Europe. Chinese company can participate, but I don't think they can just export the hell out of China into Europe. Economically, I don't see that working.